Peterson trio with Stan Getz. Uh, I'm going to fast forward through the Oscar Peterson solo, but I totally recommend that you go to Spotify and listen to this tune. Uh, but there's another sax solo coming, so let me go find it. You know, I hadn't spent that much time with Stan Getz in a really long time. I think I'm going to be spending a lot more time with Stan Getz. Uh, and I have been for the last couple of weeks as I've been studying this because 
You know, the way he plays is so unlike anybody else. I know his mentor, well, I don't know if it's his mentor, but his idol was Lester Young. And his, yeah, Lester Young plays with a much spittier on the back of the reed kind of sound. <laughs> than Stan Getz, but I don't know, that sound that Stan Getz gets, it's not Lester Young, it's not Coleman Hawkins, it is, it is purely him. And you know, you may know him from some of the sort of Brazilian stuff that he did with Joao and Astro Gilberto. But anyway, enough about talking about Stan Getz, how do we sound like this monster, monster saxophone player? And first thing that I realized that I had to do was that I had to chill the f out. He plays, when I look at videos of him, here's one right here, he doesn't really move. His face is active and his brain is clearly active, but his body is as chill as it gets. He barely moves at all. When he gets really excited, he moves a little bit, but you can't really see much in his body and it's got no tension at all. So what, as I started to look at him, I, I experimented with some of the uh, tactics that I used to try to get the uh, Coleman Hawkins sound, not the same thing. So what I looked at was I, I, I took a close look again at Stan Getz's embouchure and his setup. So Stan Getz plays on a rubber mouthpiece. Now these are a bit larger in the mouth, okay, than a, than a metal mouthpiece that a lot of sax players, including Coleman Hawkins played. Uh, so it's got this bigger material uh, in his face. I'm looking at how he approaches the mouthpiece. And he has a tendency to have a massive overbite, but the overbite doesn't stay because his bottom lip is moving up and down, or at least pivoting up and down on the reed itself. So. It, it, it's an overbite and I tried to sound like that, but it, it, it didn't exactly give me what I wanted. The second thing I noticed about him is that he takes a lot of lower lip into his mouth as he's playing. And so there's a lot more lip on the reed, which tends to, you know, mute and deaden the reed. So I gave that a shot. I realized I was pretty close right there. So take a look at my lip here and my mouthpiece. Normally I play with just a little bit of lip over my teeth. I show. He takes that much. So instead of this, if I take more lip, and the other thing that it does, and it, it doesn't just mute the sound, it mutes the articulation. So you don't hear really sharp articulation. ticket for me just a lot more lip so that translated into something faster sounds like this <laughs> So then now we've got the sound kind of out of the way surprisingly not so difficult to do I'm going to talk to you about swinging now I'm a classically trained clarinet player and the first time that I played jazz, I did what most first time jazz players do, and that's that I overemphasized the tripletiness of a swung passage. Let me play a passage here and I'll show you exactly what I mean. <laughs> And it's certainly not what Stan Getz is doing. So I'm going to start taking apart what Stan Getz does. First of all, he swings. He doesn't swing that much. But what's more important than the actual swinging is how he ghosts notes, how he emphasizes certain notes and de-emphasizes others. Now, we've talked about this before, but it bears repeating in this passage as well. First, I'm going to play these straight eighth notes without any ghosting at all. <laughs> So all pretty much the same volume. Now ghosting is choosing certain notes to de-emphasize and accenting other ones. And that all of a sudden, even if I continue to play it straight without any swing, will make it sound more like Stan Getz. Here's an example. There is no right or wrong way to do it. If you emphasize and don't emphasize others, that is going to make it sound more like jazz right off the bat. Let's now put Stan Getz under a microscope. So cool.
What we have here is a section of Stan Getz's solo just as he played it. You can hear him swinging, you can hear his articulation, you can hear all of the ghosting that he does. So let's give this a quick listen. <laughs> Now what you're looking at here is that exact same section of the solo slowed down to half tempo. So I ran this through a program that would actually stretch it out and slow it down, not changing the pitch. Uh, and what I did though was filter out the piano and the guitar and the bass so that we can focus entirely on Stan Getz. So it's going to sound a little bit weird, but what I would like you to focus on is because it's slower, it allows you to hear his swing better. Now what you're going to find is that he swings some notes more than others. In other words, he makes more of a triplet out of some than he does with others. See if you can see where that happens. Where does he play it a little bit more straight and where does he swing it a little bit more? Pretty cool, right? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this same solo slowed down and I'm going to unswing it using a little bit of audio trickery. Check this out. This is that same solo, but I've taken every other note and I've had to stretch it to make it not as swung and to even it all out. And you can actually see this visually here. The white sections of the waveform are compressed and the gray sections of the waveform are stretched. So every other note is either compressed or stretched to even it out. Why that middle one is blue, I have no idea, but give it a listen. Here you can hear for yourself that it still sounds like jazz even though it is not swung. Let's go back and listen to the fast version and hear the difference between the unswung version, I did this for that too, and the swung version. I'll play a little bit more this time. Again, this is the unswung straightened out version. Here. <laughs> And now immediately, the swung version. Stan gets he's swinging pretty hard. It's not as straight as Coltrane actually plays. Coltrane plays a little bit more straight than Stan gets. Stan gets 
has a little bit more 50s bop in his playing, I think, than Coltrane does, even at the same time uh, in the 60s that this was recorded. But just to give you an idea that it's not just about the tripletiness, it's about how you ghost it, and it's the subtlety and nuance of swinging sometimes and not swinging all of the time. So he picks some of the notes, but again, he's not making these decisions consciously. This is just part of who Stan gets is and how he's playing. So these are two technical ways that you can sound like Stan Getz. Now obviously sounding like Stan Getz is going to be nearly impossible because uh, you know he has his mouthpiece, he has his horn, he has his physiology, he has his brain, he has all the practice that he put in, and he has all of his life experiences. So we're never going to sound just like Stan Getz ever, any more than we're going to sound like anybody other than ourselves ever. But these are two ways that you can go about understanding how to get a sound that is not the sound that you usually get. So being able to be a more flexible player is the whole point of this video. Thanks again for watching and we will see you next time.